section of the library because I'm interested in the art. It's done for you. The compositions, some of the characters are constructed of a during first lockdown in COVID. Hi everyone and welcome back to Calligraphy Masters podcast. Today's guest is somebody who I didn't know. Yesterday I got a message from one of the listeners to the podcast and here is what he wrote me. Hi Milan, I have a friend who is a professional calligrapher based in the UK. His works are in the British Library and works for movies like Do Doctor Strange and been on BBC for a couple of times. He studied calligraphy at Roehampton College with Dennis Brown. He also authored a book called The Rhythm of Calligraphy. He is very skilled and knowledgeable. I highly recommend him for you for your podcast. So guys, welcome to the podcast. Satwinder Sehmi. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Hello, nice to meet you. Hey, it's nice to meet you. Like, uh, let me know just how to pronounce your name. Is it Satwinder or? Satwinder. Satwinder? Yeah, but everyone, people call me Sammy. So whichever's easier for you, I don't mind. Okay. But my name is Sequinder. Okay. I, I, I guess Sami is uh, easier for me. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. You know, because when I first came to England, I was went to school here and they said, oh, what's your name? And I said, oh, Sequinder. And they went, what? <laughs> Sequinder Semi. Oh, okay, you're Sami. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So... Yeah. Let, let's start talking about you like uh, uh sure. I, 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 ju I just present you to the podcast before you entered so yeah, tell, me, sure. tell me a bit more about you like uh yesterday I was contacted by someone who listens to the podcast and suggested me yeah. for you like I didn't know <laughs> that you exist and <laughs> yeah like he mentioned some pretty cool stuff, but before we go into this, can you tell me like how long have you been into calligraphy? At one point, at what point in your life everything started? Sure, sure, not a problem at all. Uh, I suppose I got interested in writing when I was about seven or eight at primary school in Kenya. Okay. I was in Kenya, and my teacher at school had really nice, neat italic writing, so I used to copy it, and it got to the stage then i started looking at the masthead of the national paper in kenya which was in black letter it's called the daily nation and i had no idea what i was doing you know i was taking a pencil and tracing you know doing the outlines and it got to the stage where we came to england i hadn't thought anything about it i was in the arts section of the library because i'm interested in arts i saw a section called calligraphy and I went, what's that? Uh, the first book I pulled out was Edward Johnson's Writing Letter and Illuminating. And mm. it was too difficult for me to understand because I didn't have any vocabulary for it. And uh, so I looked at the book. In fact, I've got here in this little box a first edition of his book. What? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So the... I, come, I come from the Johnstonian principles, you know. Wow. And then, and then I went to the, then I looked at other books, which I could understand. And, oh God, look, how did that book has made the hairs on my arm stand? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I feel and so I looked at books that I could vaguely understand. Uh, started doing it. It got to the stage where people were asking me to do cards for them, as they always do. Can you do a card for me? Can you do that for me? And I was coming on for about 16, 17 at the time. Uh, I actually wanted to go to Roehampton, where I eventually ended. But my parents were saying, Stupid boy, get yourself a profession, get a decent job. Uh, okay, but even then, I couldn't see a living being made out of calligraphy. Because what do calligraphers do? You know, you tell people you're a calligrapher, they think you were open toe sandals or make late posters for the women's institutes or churches and things. Uh, and, or you do grants and coats of arms. And that was all that was available at the time. 
So I started, I started studied architecture, gave up architecture because again, I wasn't mature enough to study it. it. Like with everything that you do, it's not what the course gives you, it's what you bring there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, studied architecture, couldn't get along with it, gave it up. And then I drifted into artwork, paint, painting, design, graphics. And the more I did of that, the more I realized that calligraphy could merge together and I could survive doing calligraphy, but also feeding the graphics market, which hadn't been touched at the time. And um, at this stage, I was going to an evening class to do calligraphy. And my tutor there was lovely Sally, Sally Power, and her husband is the lead on the one of the nicest men I know, uh, and he's an expert on paper. Okay. You can give him a sheet of handmade paper and he look at it, touch it, and tell you which mill made it and what the workers were probably drinking and eating when they're making it. <laughs> uh, you know, the knowledge he's got about paper is just unbelievable. I mean, if I drift off from time to time, please get me back. But I think these things are quite important to say. And Peter was the man who got me over the fear of paper. What do you mean? You have a sheet of paper that's blank. It's pure. It's perfect. The first mark you make on it is going to either fuck it up or just make it work. So you have to react to the marks that you make. And I was afraid of writing on paper, on good quality paper. And he gave me 12 antique. 12 sheets of antique handmade paper for Christmas. Uh, Peter, take these away. I'm uh, no use to me. He goes, why not? I, say, I can't write on those. They're perfect. He goes, don't be stupid. He goes, bring me a sheet. Uh, took a sheet over. And he goes, tear a strip down. And I looked at him, shocked. He goes, no, tear a strip. So I tore it. He goes, now tear it in half. Write your shopping list on the top one and chew the second bit. And that got me over the fear of paper. It's funny they just mentioned it because uh, I remember some years ago, at one point, every time I was going out and I go to the bookstore or something, I buy a sketchbook, I bring it yeah. home. And at one point, so there, was, use it. there was a yeah. stack of sketchbooks, which they were brand new. And I was like, why am I doing this? And yeah. like uh, a week it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fear. Just rip a page out of it, chew it, throw it, you know, and it'll be using them. I don't know, like, I don't know if this is going to help because back then, and, and like last week or something like this, I did a meme about this. And it seems like a lot of people have the same thing. They just buy sketchbooks and keep them like uh, not touching them. And, yeah. and even yesterday I got some handcrafted, I don't know what's called, like hand, handmade paper. Yeah. I, I, I'm like, how to use this? Like, I don't want to write on it. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. You know, when you look at it. And then also we've got a fear of writing on things that we're not familiar with. You know, you get a really kind of a cardi paper or something like that that's very much different to what you've actually seen. And you're going, well, what am I doing with this? I can't, you know, you've got to treat, of course, you've got to teach, treat every piece of paper with respect that you're working on. Uh, can you imagine working on a calf skin then? 300 pounds worth of skin like that, you know? <laughs> I cannot imagine myself writing on any skin. Like, uh, I don't even eat meat. So, like, yeah. I, I know, like, this comes from the history. Like, people used to write on vellum and stuff like this. But yeah. uh, this is something that, like, okay, we live in a modern world. I know this is how it started. But uh, yeah, sure, sure. I and prefer they, not to. Yeah, it's, it's an option. It's a choice. But then again, certain materials are better for working on for a certain project. Yeah. Okay. For, for what kind of project is good to write on such skin? I did a manuscript book. Okay. Is this, is this the rhythm of calligraphy you're talking about? Or? No, no, no. It was all handmade. The book was all handwritten. Okay. One off. It was a birthday present for... I like to keep the names of my clients fairly quiet. But yeah, yeah, fair it was for it. How big was this book? Like how many pages? 32 pages. 32 pages. And how long time did it take you to write it? I had to do it in a week and a half and have it bound. 
Wow. And I, I went to Dublin to buy the calf skin because it was cheaper for me to buy it, fly out there, buy it, and come back. And the quality there is so much better. And I've got a very good friend of mine who lives in Dublin, Dennis Brown. Dennis Brown? Yeah. 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 Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, you, you studied with Dennis? Yeah, he was a year ahead of me. Um, okay. We, for a while, we lost touch with each other. And I'll explain how and why it happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I flew there, came back the same afternoon, did the whole book within a week and had it bound. I'd also made a wooden slipcase for it. That slipcase was really nice to, to have done because I used to work in Clerkenwell workshops, which is a big kind of, we, we had about 130 small studios there. And you could find anything that you wanted done, somebody was doing it. We had people who dyed buttons to a particular colour. One uh, was uh, a carpenter. To call him a carpenter is an insult because he was an artist with wood. He used to make his own cellos. Yeah, and I asked him, I said, Tony, I've got a day, but can you make me a drop back box? He goes, yeah, sure. He looked around and he found this tree trunk about a big. And he goes, I collected this during the big storm in 19, whatever it was, about 20 years ago. And he goes, it's dried now. And it was done. He did it. All right, it'll tell you. It was Elton John's 50th birthday present. Wow. Wow. Like, <laughs> I had already so many questions and now you like, I guess I'm going to have a lot more. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I was going to show it to you later, but as it came up in the conversation, might as well carry on and do it. Do it. Yeah. Um, I'm there somewhere. Whoa. <laughs> he's a lovely man anyway as I digress so paper and then Sally said to me Sally I think if you want to carry on doing calligraphy because I can't really help you you should go to Rowhampton and I thought about it for about 30 seconds and I thought yeah I will but I had enough money to pay for it for the course and I applied for it got in and initially it was a nightmare. And I have to thank Anne Camp, my tutor, because we have a saying in India that a person with one eye is king of the blind. In the evening classes, I was the king. <laughs> when I went to Rohampton, I realized I was, I was told how little I knew. I had really bad habits. I didn't understand anything. Well, I did, but not to really understand and develop. And well, for the first six months, it was really hard work. I wanted how, to take... how old were you at that point? Oh, this is second career. I was, mid, I was 30. Does this mean that uh, until 30, everything that you know about calligraphy was uh, self-taught? or Yeah, self-taught. But... You pick up bad habits, you don't know what you're doing, you don't have an understanding, you're just copying, you're just mm -hmm. imitating, you're not creating, without, yeah. you're copying without understanding. And that's what Anne taught, taught us. It was really difficult, but it was absolutely brilliant, you know. And this book of hers, Everyone, you know, the understanding that she taught. I mean, what's happening nowadays is that there's lots of people doing calligraphy, which I think is a great thing. All they're doing is they're writing letters, four letters, three letters. I can write a letter in Gothic, put it up, and you get 20,000 likes. And you put a decent piece of calligraphy and there's about 20 likes to it. Uh, because it's instant gratification. You know, you've got these pilots that you don't have to worry about flow, you don't have to worry about anything. It's almost like going on a conveyor belt. It's the understanding that, without being arrogant, that a lot of good calligraphers have at the moment, it's not there in the, in the future generations that are coming up. 
And I think that because you've got a legacy that comes down from Johnson, all right, there's the cock side of it as well, the German side of it. But that legacy should be given along the route. But there's very few people who want to spend time understanding it because I teach a bit as well. People just just don't want to spend time learning it. I mean, I remember with Anne Pam, I'd, uh, I used to buy layout paper, not just A3 pads. I used to buy a big roll of it because it was cheaper. Uh, and I wrote on a roll, which must be, that one. I can measure it for you. Yeah. Inches. The 100 centimeters by 75 centimeters. And I wrote three, five mil havoc foundation hand, covered it, worked on it overnight, and I pinned it up. And came up, looked at it, and I thought she was going to say, Yeah, well done. And all she said was, mm. These three letters are nice. Walked mm. away. <laughs> uh, you think either I kill her now, which won't be very good. But what that did was it made me go back and look at why those three letters were nice. Understand them. And that was like an eye opener for me. And after college, after Anne had retired, we became friends and used to go and see her at home. And she said to me, Sammy, the only reason I stuck with you and I was quite severe was because I saw something there. Happy that she said so. And she stuck with me. And good teachers are just priceless. Uh, but before I went to Roehampton, I spent a week with Donald Jackson and he told me so much that those, I mean, Again, we're good friends, and Donald did a lot of work for my book. He gave it to me for free, he didn't charge me anything. Uh, he's very encouraging. Uh, what I learned from him in that one week is still resonating. And there was once when, after I'd left college about five years, six years later, I couldn't write italics. I just couldn't, you know. And I rang Donald up, and I said, Donald, help. He goes, what? So I can't write italics. He goes, good. And I said, well, what do you mean, good? He goes, because you're ready for the next stage, because the learning curve in calligraphy doesn't go up like that. It goes up, then you plateau off, and then you dip. And then you come up higher than where you were. The things that he taught, you know, like the understanding of letter form, how letters are put together, the construction of it, what a, for want of a better word, the architecture of letters. I'll show you this book. Before you continue, you, you said like you had you didn't know it uh, italics, but until that point, what were the script that you were able no, to no, write? No, I could sorry, I could write italics. I was okay. good, I was fluent at it. But all of a sudden everything broke down. Couldn't construct the letters. Like I had like a brain fog or a mental breakdown for it that I just couldn't I, I knew how to write letters. But they weren't coming out the way I wanted them to. The pen was not bending to my will. Until that point, what were the scripts that you were able to write, or at all least that them. you, all of them? Yeah. What What do you mean all of them? Like the, there is, I don't know, hundreds probably. I don't know, probably even more than hundreds of scripts. If I look at something, because I've been taught how to analyze it, understand it, I can reproduce it. Okay, so let me ask it like. <laughs> What were the first three scripts that you were able to write ever? Foundation. The foundation? Yeah, italic. And then there's a variation of, of the foundation line called the Canute, um, mm. which is based on the Canute chapter character, but black letter I could write. Fundamentally, calligraphy is the understanding of it. Once you get your head around it, it's really easy. Uh, one of the most important pages ever was given to me by Donald Jackson and it's reproduced in my book. Donald Jackson, is this a is this a calligrapher? Like like I never heard this name. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just cut this off here. Uh, Donald Jackson is is known as the father of modern calligraphy. I'm starting to get confused because different people on the Podcasts are telling different names, and I'm like, who? 
Who is the father actually? One says this name, another one says this name. I mean, Donald was known as uh, the Henry Moore of calligraphy. That's one of Donald's pieces. This piece here, this page here, is probably the most valuable tool a calligrapher can have. How to analyze a hand. This is the hand we're looking at, the Ramsey Salter, which leads to the round hand. And what you do is you look the most constant pen angle. What is the angle of the slope of the letters? Are they upright? Do they lean? What's the widest stroke not affected by pressure? How many X with nibwits is the X height? How many nibwits wide is the letter O? What's the shape of the letter O? How is the letter constructed? The, how is this reflected in the overlapping arc? reflected in la other letters. Are the serifs constructed? Where's the stem branch from? What direction is the pen moving? What is the likely stroke sequence for each letter? What is the height of the ascenders descenders? Interline space, the size of the original lettering. And once you get to understand that, you begin to understand how to put letters together, how to make an... What I want to do is to create a unified alphabet rather than just write letters. Because with a unified alphabet, you construct an alphabet that you understand. And to me, when I'm working, it's like a game of chess. Right? I look at the le what letter is going to be before what I've written, what's above it, what's below it, what's next. So, And then you juggle it and make it into a texture. And you make it into something that's unified rather than just writing individual letters. There's no rhythm in that. Mm -hmm. That's why my book is called The Rhythm of Writing, because it's all about rhythm. Yeah, it's quite, it's, calligraphy is quite like dance and music to me, because that dance is a series of rhythmic movements in space. Music is a series of rhythmic movements like that. And so it's calligraphy, uh, but with, dance and music if a dancer makes a bad move it's forgotten till the next one musician makes a bad note it's forgotten till the next one with calligraphy it's very different your marks are permanent you can't change them it's it's funny that some of the stuff you say i'm like amazed because uh for example paul antonio i guess you know paul antonio yeah yep <laughs> i know him he's a very good friend of mine and he he yeah. says some of the same things that you're telling me for example like a lot of people are, they are just writing one letter. And I think even John Stevens mentioned this on his, his podcast. It's it's very easy to write, uh, well, one letter, but how about writing a whole page? Exactly. Text? Thank you. I rest my case. You know, because there's no texture, there's no color, there's nothing. I mean, again, with calligraphy, you know, I think that every graphic designer or should study calligraphy. Mm -hmm. Every typographer should study calligraphy. I've designed typefaces, I know, but people should study calligraphy to do it because it gives you so much control over a page. You can't understand. Which, which is this book that you just showed me with this uh, analysis? It's mine. Let's talk about uh, a bit about this book. Like you said, the name is Rhythm of Writing. Calligraphy uh, is a rhythm of writing, yeah. Yes. At what point in your life you... Uh, made this book and what led to the book how does one person feel ready to write a book or whatever to share knowledge i felt i was ready to write it what happened was uh, i was teaching an evening class after i left Roehampton. I advertised the course and a, an editor from a publishing company used to come to the place the place where i taught was called the waterman's art center uh, it had entertainment there, either the cinema, it had a bar they used to put plays on and things. And also it was right on the bank of the River Thames in London. And the editor, commissioning editor was there. Uh, she left a note for me, would I be interested in doing a book on calligraphy? Uh, my first initial reaction was no, because there's so many books on calligraphy. But then I thought, hang on, can I do it the way I want to? Uh, they said, yeah, sure. So what I, what's different about this book is that I want people to create a unified alphabet, not just 
copy it. And normally when you look at a book, they've got A, one, two, three strokes. The doctors? What I've done is the first stroke is red, second blue, third green, fourth yellow, so that you can actually see where the overlapping of the strokes is. The letter is not distracted by arrows going with it. So I want people to be able to create a unified alphabet and understand how letters are put together. Uh, letters become part of you. That's one of Dennis's pieces of work. Uh, that page, I mean, every calligraphy should have it. Understand it. You want to do a black letter, look at the sample of black letter, you'll be able to work it out for yourself. All these variations of the italic hand. I guess this book is for uh, beginners? Or? I'd like to think that even those who can, who, who are competent in calligraphy can learn from it. What exactly is uh, this book useful for? What exactly can you learn from it? Some people nothing. <laughs> Some people probably would look at calligraphy in a slightly different eye, with a slightly different mindset. And what else? Yeah, I suppose it's also focuses your head when you go through the book and there might be things that you haven't thought of there might be things that you have thought of you know knowledge the more knowledge you have the more choices you can make and the better decisions you can make by reading this book i, I mean i talk about different things in there understanding lettering uh I mean, that page there for example right wow all that is written with the same nib difference in texture you get from there to there hmm. it's huge is this a book available online yeah and then you mentioned on instagram that herman zaf the legend has told you that it's a wonderful teaching book with precise information so does this mean that uh, while mr herman was alive you were a friend of uh, with him yes can you see that piece there yeah Huh. It's, a limited, it's a limited edition print. From, wow. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> I mean, I'm divorced now, but when I was married, if you'd come to my house, you could see the chair Herman's half sat on while he had dinner with me, the plate he ate from with the dinner. You know, like I started calligraphy masters nine years ago. And yeah. uh, when I started it, Mr. Herman was still alive. So it was yeah. really a dream of mine to meet him, to have an interview or something. But then, yeah, yeah a few years I mean, ago, he passed away. Yeah, with me. I mean, I was into, I mean, when I was doing my book, I had the cheek audacity to ask all the calligraphers around the world for examples, because I'd set out the chapters, what I wanted to show with the chapters. John Stevens sent me work, Julian Walter sent me work, and Heckle, everyone. Mm -hmm. Donald, Brody, Herman, was, uh, Werner Schneider. Herman Saf was the only calligrapher I didn't have the courage to ask for it. And then we were introduced years later, and I said to him, shaking hands, Professor Saf, <laughs> Did you sign my book for me? Because when I was at college at Roehampton, I bought his book, his design and philosophy, and it cost me sixty pounds, and I didn't eat for two weeks because I didn't have any money there. Uh, he goes, "Yes, uh, my book was in my studio, so I sent him a copy of my book, and Herman Zaff signed an alphabet and he wrote an alphabet in his book." And I remember the quote round it for that when they sent me with common affection for calligraphy, yours, Herman. Somebody oh. has stolen that book with the letter that came with it. What? Bastards, yeah. The nearest thing I've got to that book now is that Herman was so encouraging that when we were sitting, I told him that. I've done a piece of mine at six foot square on permanent display of the British Library. Uh, he goes, oh, unfortunately, I have to fly back to Germany tomorrow. Uh, they won't be able to see it. I said, OK, no problem at all. You know, at least he was considering, he said to me that he'd, going to, he'd like to see it. Because, you know, I showed him a picture about that big, like a postcard. And the thing's six foot square, and you know, it's totally different in real life. Uh, and this was, and on a Monday, the following Monday, I got a phone call at work at lunchtime. 
And it says, Sir this is Professor Zach. I'm just at the British Library. I've seen your work. It's very good. Keep up. You just want to curl up your toes and die then, don't you? you like, does life get better than that? You just mentioned the uh, British Museum. Yeah, the British yeah. Library. How do you get your work featured in such places? <laughs> Word of mouth, nepotism, I suppose. Seriously, yesterday when this dude wrote me and when I found you on Instagram, I'm like, yeah. I see you have like 394 followers. And I'm like, Whoa, what is happening? Like a few weeks, like two weeks ago, I think I released the episode with Daniel Reef. I don't know if you know him. Oh, he did the uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Narnia and some other movies. And he's the same case. He had like 900 followers. So I'm like, how, what? Yeah, we'll talk, <laughs> we'll talk about this. Later. We'll talk about this. But my point is, I I don't understand how like such amazing calligraphers and artists, which produce such amazing work, working with huge clients, and probably it's not nobody, but at least like my generation and the younger people who are just right now into the calligraphy. I don't think any of them knows this work. So like. Uh, why? Because they, they look at instant gratification. They go on YouTube and they see somebody who's written A, B, C, D, E, F. Oh, I can do that. Okay. They're not going to look at the wider picture. What What do you mean by the wider picture? What, what, okay, let me ask it like this. What do you think it's wrong in our days for the calligraphy world? And what should be improved? The understanding should be improved. The passion should be... All right, they've got a passion, but then again, the writing is very static. You know, there's no emotion into the work. It's like... It, it's when I write, I write with the whole of my body. It's it's like playing tennis. Calligraphy is three dimensional. You know, mm -hmm. if you well, if you play tennis, you don't the ball doesn't come and hit your racket like that and drop down. What you do is you approach the ball, you hit the ball, and then you follow through. This is what happens with calligraphy. Mm -hmm. And most of the work that you see is just going really static, and it, the understanding isn't quite there. You know, write a Paragraph, write more than four letters, five letters, you know, make it into a unified piece of work. You think this is one of the most important things, people to be able to write longer texts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even if you're asking somebody to design an invitation card for you, it's not going to have four words on each line. In other words, it'll go like this. I mean, if you look at Homer's Zapp's work, it's got a fluidity to it. And also the other thing is that there's no immediacy in calligraphy anymore. People spend more time retouching a letter up than writing it. Yeah. Can you I guess so. Yeah, yes, yes, I understand. I'm just like, yeah. you, you're just saying things that I, I didn't think about and it, it makes sense. And yeah, you know, these are the things that should be allowed to people. And the reason why I've only got 300 odd followers is because I just don't write letters and post them. I, I guess like John John was speaking something about this. He, he mentioned that he's not making videos because everybody is making videos. Why should he? Yeah. He also mentioned that when he was very young and when they were producing work like him and some other calligraphers. Yeah. It was it was not a normal thing to take pictures like our generation does. Exactly. Yeah, you're not posting much, but I guess you're full of like you have, I don't know, a lot of your work. I'll show you some. Yeah. I've got some originals. Okay. Let's go through the oh, remind me to talk about this book, which is just brilliant. It's called The Masters of Italic Writing. Wow. Examples in there. Or the famous scribes from the 17th century, right? And it analyzes, looks at it. Uh, because by looking at this, you could actually make this into your own alphabet, you could make a unified alphabet based on that. You know, you could look at the angle of the pen, anyone can do that. Uh, it's one, what is it called? Yeah. And at the end of the book, you call a combination of letters, how they're put together. Oh, it's just a beautiful book. Are those books like, uh, I don't know, are they available for people? Because I feel like some of your yeah. books are like not available anymore. Or am yeah, I wrong? This, I mean, you might have to search for them. There's a website called AB Books. ABE book. Uh, you can buy books so much cheaper there. 
than you can. And again, you know, it's such a wonderful, there's so much skill in this book. You can't go wrong. You could just sit there for hours and look at it. And yeah, this, this letter A here, I don't know if you can see it. It's, yeah. Donald said, right, I want you to make it. But the way you did it was you traced the outline of the letter with your fingers, how it was mm. done. Right, what that does, it serves it in your brain. And then you do the same letter imaginary on a large sheet of paper using your arm to work with. So that saves it in your muscle memory. So when you come to do the two of them together, the whole thing works. What I did a few years ago was I was just looking through the book and I came across this page. Where is it gone? Uh, see that? Yeah. Oh, you did it or is it just me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you did it, yes. Yeah, yeah, to show that you've got the understanding of what you're doing, how it's put together, the line space, how the letters merge with each other, how they sit with each other. Okay, now that I saw your, the one you made, it made me think, did you use guidelines? Uh, for this one I did, yeah. Like, But you, okay. using guidelines is, is a funny thing, depends on what you're working on. It's like Edward Johnson in one of his books said that Writing between two lines is like dancing in a ballroom where the ceiling and the floor is the same height as you. Yeah, wait, wait I, I'm just like, I'm very confused. Yeah. I understand. I understand what yeah. you're saying. I'm just confused because I am like, I have another podcast, which, which is only me and Paul Antonio speaking. And uh, for a long time, he's been like, Milan, use guidelines, use guidelines. Because like, you know, a lot of times I'm just, I don't want to spend time it takes too long time to draw yeah. the lines and stuff. I, I prefer to like, write letters. And at yeah, some point, okay. at some point, he convinced me that it's important to use guidelines in order to be able to write in straight line. Pointy and... pen, you need guidelines. Yeah. Oh, so now, 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 now that you're saying this, uh, I'm confused because I don't know. That, yeah, like the main, the main uh, script that I use is it's it's fracture. Yeah. Am okay. I supposed to use guidelines or am I not supposed to use guidelines? For those of you who are just listening to the podcast, again, I guess it's better to see the video on YouTube because uh, Mr. Sami is going to show some stuff. Can you see? Uh, no. So why are you preparing this? I have a question. Which was the easiest script for you to learn and which was the hardest one? They all are. When you start, they all are difficult. Once you know what you're doing, they all become easy. Still, come on, I mean, you know what I ask. Some some scripts are easier than others. Like, of course, they're yeah. all hard to you, but like some are just easier than others. Yeah, I suppose to me, the italic was the easiest, but again, also very difficult because with the italic, what you've got, what happens is that the width of it can mm -hmm. alter because it's based on an oval and an ellipse, but not the, the round hand. It's a particular O, oh, it's round. I am the fastest nib in the West. <laughs> uh, is this a fact or you're just saying it? I'm just saying it, but nobody can argue with it. <laughs> Is this considered gestural calligraphy, yes. right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, because uh, this Monday is actually coming out an uh, episode with Yves Leterme. Yeah. And, and uh, it, it's funny because I recorded the episode last year and it was very new to me. So when he was speaking, I was like, I didn't know much about it. But I don't know, last few months, I'm really into it and I really like it. Damn, you write way too fast. <laughs> I really like what you said about guidelines, but yeah. based on what you said, what, what's what's the trick to be able to write in a straight line without uh, guidelines? Working on it. Working on it. I never use the word practice because practice only teaches you to practice. <laughs> like, oh, I'm just practicing so straight away. Work huh. on it. Look at it. You know, okay. this I've just written without thinking mm. 
Yeah, but uh, <laughs> saying working on it sounds easy, but come on, there there must be some like give some advice or tips for people like not only for me but the people who are watching and listening i guess a lot of people are interested to learn how exactly yeah. is it, what what exactly contains this working on it what 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 you do is of course there's pieces that i work on that require a lot rooting up and right for example if i show you are you gonna write more i oh, will do later but let me show you this first this piece well, i did when I'm not turning it around, is that one of the members of parliament Whoa. there's a killing three two years ago of the girl called Sarah Everard who was killed by a policeman. Okay. He raped her and killed her. So the MP read the names of 120 women who have been killed where the man was the sole perpetrator of their murder. Huh. So the most unnecessary memorial names of names read by Jess Phillips in, in the House of Commons who've been killed where a man is the primary perpetrator. So it made it look like a tombstone. Yeah. Wow. And for this, yes, I ruled up just the top, just the bottom line. So this is also without guidelines? No, the bottom line was ruled up. What, what do you mean the bottom? Oh, just one line. Yeah, just one line. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, That's what I meant by the ballroom, dancing in the room where you're the same height. So this is actually probably a good advice to use just one line instead of two, three or four. Yeah. With a pointy pen, you need one. You'll need more. But well, with this, I just use one line and that's it. I, I don't really use pointed nips, like pointed yeah. pen. <laughs> like... I mean, again, with this piece. Oh, that's nice. I have one as well. Uh, here. Yeah. This is by Paul Antonio. Okay. <laughs> but but this the nice. goat on yours looks much more shiny. I don't know. It's it's yeah, really it's really nice. nice. But the thing is, this piece is has changed over time. What do you, like the color of the goat or what? The color of the silver. Yeah. Uh, I think I've got a picture of it somewhere because this is a poem by one of my favorite poets, Pablo Neruda. Huh. And that line that's been taken out, when you translate it, says, A magnificent slave of the circle that moves in turn through black and gold. So the yeah. silver has tarnished, it's going to become black. Yeah. See, that letter, the character the W is in gold. Yes. And the rest of it is in black, so you can only see it occasionally huh. when the light hits it right. Yeah. And it's a sense of wonder. This piece is 9-11. Okay. The Twin Towers. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. The planes crashing into it, but a phoenix arising from the ashes. Huh. Go this no, black one. Nice. Oh, are, is this in the goat like the eyes and the nose? Of... It's an angel. It's an oh, okay. It looked something else to me, but now yeah. I can see it. Now I can see the angel. Yeah, yes, because the translation is in German by Brett. I think it's by Rilke, and it says, "Who, if I cried." would hear me amongst the angelic orders. You know, I am uh, I, I really lo love calligrams, and uh, <laughs> so this to me is like, hmm, this is super cool. Thank you. I mean, this is the first piece I did. It was done about 20 years ago. Huh. And Whoa. It's on, it's on climate change. Okay. And a client, a client of mine asked me to do a piece, and he said, use the words man, Earth and cosmos, that man has damaged the planet. And there wasn't enough with, for me to work with. Uh, so I said, let's come up with quotes that are tell us. And this piece, it depends how you look at it. See, if you look at it this way, you're looking up into the piece, so it's positive. Yeah. But if you do look at it that way, you're just being sucked into the piece. That's funny. Uh, you know, it's got a sense. 
every piece of work that I do, I like to make something positive. And it says, Earth felt the wound and nature from her. Steeped time through all her work, work, works gave signs of woe that all was lost. You know, like your calligraphy is stunning. I, I'm in love with your letters. Like, I mean, your your book is called The Rhythm of Calligraphy, but when <laughs> I look into your, your calligraphy, it, yeah. I really could see your rhythm that you write, and this is yeah. super amazing. Thank you. Wow. Now, this piece is very special. It, it looks special. Whoa. The original had this line in gold. Okay. And it is Nelson Mandela's inauguration speech. Huh. You know, I, I, I did it for an exhibition I had in Holland. I didn't sell the piece of work. Uh, came to London and about 12, 15 years ago, someone called me on a Thursday afternoon and said, could we have 24 handmade menus for tomorrow? <laughs> I just laughed. <laughs> well, I, I won't say what I told them, but I, I, they said, oh, it's for Nelson Mandela. I said, okay, how much do I pay you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did the work overnight. They came to pick the work up and I said to them, is there any chance I could present this piece to him? It was framed, ready to go. And again, on this, you can probably see that I've just got the bottom line. Huh. Okay, you 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 mentioned earlier it's 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 I guess people should start like writing whole pages. And now me looking to this page, like I'm wondering how how long time did it take to write the this whole page? Are you writing with the same speed that you wrote earlier? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess I should give up on calligraphy. <laughs> no, it should encourage you. I mean, this, I don't know. Like this is such a beauty. I, I don't like. I don't know. I have another Freedom. question. Yeah. Be, like while while you were studying calligraphy and uh, developing your skills, how much yeah. time were you putting into practice? Of course, you just mentioned that practice is like not good, but like yeah. I guess how much time you were you spending on writing every day? Oh, hours. 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 Yeah. A lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, literally. At college, we'd get tutorials from Anne. We'd look around other people's work. So you're at college four days a week. At night, I'd work maybe three, four hours every day, maybe sometimes five, depending on how I felt. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're working, it's important to walk away from your work after about half an hour or an hour because you get tired and then you begin making mistakes. Uh, when you make mistakes... You get frustrated, so you don't do anything. So anyway, going back to this, and so they, I said to them, could I present this piece to him? And they said, oh, no, security is too tight, this, that, and the other. So I said, okay, could you give it to him on my behalf? And they said, yeah, sure. And this was on a Friday, Friday evening, Friday afternoon. Monday, a courier arrived with this for me. Huh. It's the menu I've done for Nelson Mandela. He signed it, sent it to me. So you're telling me you did 24 of those menus in one night? Yeah. How uh, many pages is this? That. It's just that, like two pages? And they're, yeah, and they cover inside page and they're hand sewn. This menu is like two or four pages together, all together? For, uh, two pages folded into eight. Okay. Yeah. And you did 24 of those? In one night? Yeah. What the? How is this even possible? <laughs> it happens. It's because I d I've spent so much time just working and working on it. And I, like this piece here, uh, I did a talk for a design agency. Uh, I made a poster for it. How are you getting such clients? Like, you're not, like, I barely knew. Like, I didn't know anything about you. You have some huge yeah. clients. How how are you lending such people to be your clients? Like, is it... it's, it's word of mouth. 
and more importantly, being available when they want work to do, to be done and also being good at what you do help. <laughs> of course, of course. Look, there we are, the fastest nib in the West from the East. <laughs> this is and, super yeah, cool. <laughs> and it's quite clever what they've done. North, East, South, <laughs> West. <laughs> That's cool. Quite that thing by Nelson Mandela. And again, you know, when we're writing, the rhythm in different languages is different. Mm -hmm. Like this is in English. It's a Jack Kerouac like, I have nothing to offer anybody except my own confusion. That's confused, right? It's written, bang, so you can read it. There's a gold circle that's totally perfect. Yes. But that, to get that right there, takes courage and balls. Huh. But if you do the same thing in French, it's got a different texture to it. Why is that? It's a sequence of letters. I see. And if you try and write Dutch, for Greek. Huh. <laughs> I was interviewed once by a Dutch design agency. And they said to me, what's the difference in uh, Dutch and English? I said, in <laughs> Dutch, you've got too many vowels in different places. <laughs> and this is a poster you know, from the British Library. The first exhibition they had. So you got into the British Library again from mouth to mouth or what? Yeah, yeah. And also because when you're researching, you know, I don't know, it's like osmosis. The words pass, they go through and stuff. And they go, okay, this one. I still haven't taken the lines out. But during first lockdown in COVID, people were running marathons in their back garden. Yeah. Yeah. I did a marathon session of calligraphy. <laughs> of course. It is. Wow. wow. There isn't much on your Instagram. Where can people see your work? I mean, I'm going to start posting more. My website will be ready in about two weeks' time. Okay. Calligraphy.vip. Okay. I guess. So, guys, by the time this podcast is out, the website yeah. should be up already. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, this wow. piece I did. Also, I was thinking you have already a book, but have you considered doing a book just with uh, the artworks of yours? I Some... probably won't have enough at the moment. What do you mean you don't have enough? It seems it'll like a... you have a lot. <laughs> it'll be a very thin book. <laughs> what? But I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of putting things together. This I did when. You know, George Floyd, who was killed by a policeman who, who had mm -hmm. his knee on his neck for nine minutes, 29 seconds? Yeah. Hmm. I wrote I wrote his name for nine minutes, 29 seconds, and that's what I got to. Well, like, <laughs> I, I, like I, I really like your cre creativity and the way you build up your artworks. Like, you, you re you're not just a calligrapher, you're an artist. Thank you. It's nice to hear that. But, you know, it's like... Calligraphy is a basic tool that I use. I love writing. I want to express myself through it. Hmm. And, you know, most people, I don't know, there's few of us who will work like that. Who are those names? Give me some names. Probably it will be useful for people to know. Dennis, Dennis Brown. Okay. He's one of them. Donald's work, which you must see if you haven't. Send some, some of his work to you. He's written a book called The Story of Writing. But you should see his stuff. He's the one who did the St. John's Bible. Okay. And Brody's good. Yeah, Brody, I know. Brody, I have already a podcast with him. It's not out yet, but I yeah. mean, but by the time your podcast, this episode comes out, it should be out already. Uh, Brody was one of our, one of my tutors at Roehampton. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brody, who else? does work like that. I think Thomas isn't doing that much work. Uh, the thing is that, unfortunately, with calligraphy at the moment, a lot of people have got a position or authority beyond their abilities. What do you mean? They're being worshipped 
and they're being kind of put on the pedestal and told that they're good. Whereas I don't think it should go that far. You know, I, I can pass, I won't name anyone, but I can pass judgment through my experience and my ability. Uh, so I think I'm entitled to do that because other people, I put my work out in the public domain yeah. and other people can slide it off if they want. Right, be so if it needs to be. Oh, you're saying how far do I write? That sheet, that, and that took three hours, 12 minutes. Wow, wow, like uh, I'm blown away. So earlier you mentioned your teaching. So what kind of workshops are you teaching? Is it something that has to do with what we see on the paper you showed? Yeah, I mean, basically, I want you to understand and create a unified alphabet and be able to develop, develop for yourself rather than just copy it. Understand what I'm talking about. Understand what you're looking at. Feel it. And then... Yes, of course, we imitate to start with to understand it, but then make it yours. Is it, is this what you're teaching or you're teaching specific yeah. script or something like this? I mean, I can teach a particular script, but learning a script is easy once you've gone through the basic development. I mean, I can take a piece, I can do black letter. I wanted to ask you, do you have some work with black letter or fracture? Yeah, uh, just a moment, I'll just go and get it. Is this is this supposed to be fracture? Yeah, it's like a black letter. Okay, because it's, I mean, it's the thing is that with black letter, you should look at the word work of this calligrapher in America. He doesn't he hasn't done it much for a while. Ward Dunham. Okay. Uh, the thing with black letter gothic fracture is that it's a battle between the black and the white, <laughs> <laughs> and the white won't win. <laughs> This is so cool. Yeah. Piece is, a, I'm not happy with it, but it's because, you know, if I don't put that kind of thing there, oh, the would be too well, white. Wait, you just said something that uh, it's, it's, I'm interested to know because the, like the majority of artists, calligraphers, whatever you call it, yeah, that I know, including myself, are almost never satisfied with their work. So, yeah. How how does this work for you? Like, is it the oh, majority the majority of time you're happy with your work or you're not happy? The best piece I'm gonna do is the next one. <laughs> okay, I, I I understand this, but still, yeah. Like, tell me in percentage. Like, is it fifty fifty? Sometimes, like, let's say fifty percent of the time you like what you've done, and fifty percent you don't like, or or is it other way? Yeah, it's difficult to put a number onto it because basically what happens is that. Sometimes you're working to a commission. Sometimes you're working to what the client wants. Mm -hmm. uh, what the client wants is not what you necessarily want. Hmm. Yes. And uh, so if the client is satisfied, then I'm satisfied. Of course. Yeah. But a client might not be satisfied with what I'm satisfied with because my vision is slightly different to theirs. Well... I think it's more than slightly <laughs> the majority <laughs> of the cases, but I got yeah. your, I got your point. Let me get back to the workshops. I'm I'm really interested to know some stuff. What you said, yeah, like I can. Uh, it depends on how many what people are interested in, what they want to know. Uh, every workshop can be tailored to whatever the demand is. Mm -hmm. I'm not being kind of flippant, but what I want to teach. What the way I'd like to teach is probably maybe not the way people want to learn. Okay. Because but... I've got I've got a depth of knowledge that's further than theirs. Can you turn the phone again? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah because I've got an understanding which they probably don't have without me being arrogant. No, no, of course not. Yeah. And so I would this way the way I would really like to teach it is to get you to understand, analyze, and work it. It's harder to learn, but it's more be beneficial in the longer term. Yeah. Uh, my next question is 
Do you teach this only in person or you do also online classes? I can't, I'm starting to do them online now. My next question is, are you interested in do such class in collaboration with Calligraphy Masters? Like we do it together on Zoom and the like the audience of Calligraphy Masters will probably yeah. like. Sure. Like, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a pleasure because the more people I can, not affect, but I can get to look at calligraphy in a slightly more creative, more understanding way, mm -hmm. I'll be happy because we've got a legacy from our education that we should leave yeah. to, to everyone else. And it's difficult doing it, but it, now the internet's got a far greater audience. Yes, definitely. Yeah, you know, like the way I teach, it's not going to happen overnight. Of course, like, I don't think anyone can expect, like, to learn anything overnight. Even if you go on a, just a basic workshop, yeah, yeah, the workshop could be one or two days, but you cannot expect after those one or two days to be able to write. No, exactly. You, you get the, the knowledge and the tricks and everything else, but yeah. it takes you know, time. Then, you know, it's not what I give you, it's what you give me. Yeah. Uh, the more you give me, the easier it becomes for you. It's hard work. Nothing worth achieving is ever easy, unless you happen to be a genius who just looks at it and go, yeah, I can do that. Uh, John Stevens can. <laughs> so you're a genius too, because earlier you mentioned, I just need to see the script and then I can write it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we have like John Stevens, you, Two geniuses so far. That that's that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you've got to feel for it. Like I said, you've got to let the pen bend to your will. If you can mm -hmm. see it, you can do it. Is italic what you use mostly? Because I don't know. Like seems from what I've seen of the pieces that you showed, I guess it's mostly yeah, italic. Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on what script is necessary to express that emotion for the piece of work. You okay. know, if, if it. Like this, this piece is dark. I mean, so the one with the cross on it, with that, with the black letter, it, it's going to end up like a cross, and it's Elton John's song "Funeral for a Friend." So the words give you, give you a meaning. They, they kind of get you along the route, and you've got to feel each piece of work that you do. You know, layout isn't something that calligraphers really work on at the moment. You know, if you ask them to do a large piece of work, they, they. I wouldn't know where to start. You think layout is a very important part of calligraphy? Absolutely. Hmm. Because calligraphy is not just writing individual letters. It's hmm. about putting the whole thing together and working on it. And you create an emotion on paper. <laughs> uh, I really like I really like how you see things and the way you think about it. It's just... It, it makes me smile. This is super cool. Good. At least so, I brought a smile. I mean, mind you, I've made grown men cry <laughs> with my work. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's perfect. So my question is, like, what would you suggest to people? Like, how how do they learn? Or uh, is there any sources or something to improve their layouts? Like, what would you suggest them to? What you want to do is to look at old masters, masters' paintings, and okay. break them down into texture. Where do you find such old masters' paintings? Rembrandt. <laughs> anyone. You know, Van Gogh. Okay. If you look at their paintings, it's tonal. Oh. You know, the composition is done for you. The composition is done. It's like this piece, important thing. Like, you know, when I was talking to you about analysis, how to look at something and make it and do it again. Mm. Yeah? This. <laughs> we came to this this point. This is from Doctor Strange, right? Yeah. Mm. So let's yeah. talk. Let's talk about this. <laughs> I mean, this is in a language I don't I can't read. It's so Tibetan this... Sanskrit. It's it's Sanskrit, right? Tibet Tibetan Sanskrit. It's a very old form of Sanskrit. But I had to do three different scripts for it. This is for the for the book. Is this an original or is it scanned? No, no, this is a photo of the original. Okay, you you don't have any of the original stuff. Ah, uh -huh. when you work for Marvel Comics, you signed NDAs, you sign your life away. Yeah, like Daniel said, pretty much the same. Yeah, uh, these this panel that they, that's there, that's on my bed. Wow. Because they asked me on a Friday, 
oh, we're filming on Monday. Can we have three of these panels done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and these are some of the writings on the walls of the temple. Wow. Um, that's the size of the temple. So you can see how big it is. Huh. Uh, a funny thing, I mean, literally, this came out of the blue for me. I'd done some work, and that's on my sheet, another page. Oh, I really like this. Yeah, you know, some of the characters are constructed of eight strokes. You cannot make this into prints? I, I don't, wouldn't have the copyright for it. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I could do different things with it, like put different text on it and stuff, because the design's mine. There was, I mean, I learned so much on this on the set. This is the only picture I took on set. Uh, that's Benedict Cumberbatch, Tilda Swinton, and those panels I did are there. And this floor, they painted at least about twenty-three different times to get the right color on on screen. So how how do you get to work for Marvel? Like, don't tell me again it's a word to mouth because this yeah. I, am, I I won't <laughs> believe it this time. Like you, if 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 this is the case, you have to have I don't know some really important prints. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I cannot understand how you land such clients. But, you know the thing is that there's so much that goes on that we're not aware of, and so many people know so many people that it's almost like whispers. You know, this happened, that happened, this happened. You know, and it does travel. Word travels, and if you happen to be good at what you do. Mm -hmm. It's best, it, it's easier to get the work. Uh, it's like oh, somebody who was at Elton John, one of Elton John's events, so my work, and keep this quiet. She happens to work for the wife of somebody whose husband was in the biggest boy band in the world. Do you know the biggest boy band in the world? Are they? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. Beatles? Beatles? Okay. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, on Instagram, I put a post out saying you remembering George on his 80th birthday. Uh, and uh, no, it just says George, 23rd of February, whenever he was born. And uh, yeah, that's in the public domain, so I can talk about it. But anything else I do for them privately, I don't talk about. I was watching Doctor Strange at home. I've got a uh, downloaded it from some. Paid to download it, and this <laughs> film got bonus features on it. Nobody watches bonus features, do they? Did you make the Doctor Strange stuff only for the second movie or for the first one as well? First one, the second, the first one, the second movie. They called me in, and we signed paperwork, NDAs, lockdown, COVID. Okay. So the whole concept of what we were going to do with the book is completely changed because they couldn't change the filming or the timing or the location or anything so they just did it it wasn't even a book in the end it was just they called it the book of ashanti but it was more like an electronic thing that they had there might be another one well i was watching the movie it finished i went to the toilet came back and i looked at the telly and i go this looks like me it's me. <laughs> <laughs> me on bonus features <laughs> that's cool <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, to teach Tilda Swinton, the actress, how to write this symbol on paper and also make it gesturally in space. This, like, you know, from Marvel, like, Doctor Strange is my favorite part. So I'm, like, when I, yesterday, this dude, when he wrote me about you, I was like, oh, definitely, we're going for a podcast. <laughs> how many pieces did you create it, actually, for? Is it a lot or is it just a few pages? Uh, it's quite a lot. I mean, the whole book itself is about that thick, but we created eight spreads and they were then copied and put together. But where they tear the page out from the book, actually an original page they tear out. We did two sets of originals. I, I did this with Daniel when we, when we spoke uh, about the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. So yeah. this is kind of a long shot, but I, I don't care. I'm just going for it. Because I, I asked him if he if he can, because, you know, he made a lot of copies of some of the stuff. Of course, the movies take most of it. And yeah. I asked him if he, if he can send me something that he did for the movie. And he did. So my question is, somehow, is it possible for you to send me anything that you've done for the movie? It would uh, be a... The answer is 
Probably, yes. <laughs> that, that will be a huge honor and seriously, I'm, it will be super exciting because, yeah. I don't know, it, it's just... Yeah, of course, no problem. But wow. there's one, there is one problem that well, I need to address. Of course. <laughs> And I need yours because I, I want to like I want to send you something as well. Thank you. These are some of the visuals that gave me. Well, damn. Yeah, and that's from these. We have to come up and create things. The art director, the producer, they had specific ideas as to what they wanted. This is like you said, Tibetan Sanskrit. Yeah. Did you have to learn it or is it again you as you said earlier I just have to see how it's written and yeah a, a really funny thing is that uh the language I, the script that I speak Punjabi which is grammatically you know they gave me all sorts of things that you have to kind of figure out how to put it together and work with it our script is not too dissimilar to this. I mean, I can't write, read the script or write it, our script as well, but I can copy it. And what we actually did was, don't tell this to anyone, right? One of the names, two names, two characters, two service, one, two words okay. are my name and the art director's name. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you write the Sanskrit also as fast as you did earlier? No, no, not, no, not at all. No. Because this is not part of my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Roman alphabet, I can do it blindfold. You know, because I've written so much of it, actually. Now this, Okay. Nice. It's the first trial. Okay. It might come to you. Okay. <laughs> what tools did you write these things for the movie, actually? Is it pointed nip or something else? No, browser. Broad Bra edge nip. Broad edge yeah. nip? Okay. Yeah. And is, is this what you prefer to work with? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but when it comes to pointy pen, you know, What's the point? Mm. Sorry, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> this is this is so cool. <laughs> oh, I like this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> no. uh, I was gonna show. Oh, right. Yeah, I was gonna do this. To show you this. When it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> You have to do that till the cows come home. Yeah. Okay. But the difficult bit is if you've got that in front of it. What thing? <laughs> what thing do you use? Oh, it's a cheap Chinese ink. Cheap Chinese ink. Okay. Okay. Like swimming, something like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but okay. I'll water it. I'll really water it down. Why is that? It's quite thick. Okay. Because if I'm making a stroke, that's from there to there, it's going to run out. You know, it's just feeling your way. You can, calligraphy is actually very sensual and sensitive. You can hear me right. Yes. Yeah, you know, this is what I was saying about calligraphy being three-dimensional. My hand didn't start there. It didn't end there. Huh. If you look, it's I might just do that, but I won't kind of do uh, and re keep retouching it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's like not, it's painting words, painting letters. Yeah. So you you write with the whole whole arm movement, right? Whole body, yeah. Yes. So my question is because whole arm movement is something I don't know. It's pretty new to me. Like I know for about it from the last one two years. Like Paul, yeah. 
has told me a, a lot about it. And I have one main issue because since I start, I'm also self-taught. And since I started, I've been writing with my fingers, you know, this is how I get used to it. And yeah. when he presented to me whole art movement, this, it, it's just too complete. Like, I don't know, maybe because I'm used to write with my fingers, but uh, my question is- spoke to him about using your whole body. Ask him who told him. The whole body? No, ask him who told him. Yes. Who told him to use the whole body? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, and my question, because I do a lot of uh, walls. I write on walls and stuff like this. Yeah. So, and I see you just, I saw you now. When you write big and when yeah. you write on a huge, something huge, it's, it's, it is easy to write with the whole arm and with the whole body. Question is, when you have to write small, how do you write with the whole arm and even with the whole body? Like when, when the text has to be really small. You develop that skill over a period of time. Yeah, but how is this happening? Can you give me some advices or tips? Like The, or... the only advice I can give you is work at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I knew. I knew you are going to say that. <laughs> You know, it's not going to come like that, you know, even again, if I get a thing there. Uh, are there any other tools that you will use to write or you're just majority of work is with the broad edge? No, any tool that is appropriate for the job that you're doing. So, are you doing brush pen calligraphy, for example? Yeah. Yeah? If I have to, yeah, of course. I guess I'm not going to ask you any advices because i guess you're gonna say just work on it <laughs> yeah literally you've got a feeling yeah. you've got a feeling, you've got spirit you know what you want to do but nobody can actually teach you how to do yeah you, they can give you advice they can put you in the right direction but end of the day oh. you know the thing is that with online workshops the problem is that you can't see the work at the time so if somebody is not doing something I wouldn't mm. say right or wrong, but if it can be improved on at that time, it's easier rather than you spending a week doing it before the next lesson. Because online, you can only see the work of two or three people. Yeah. You can't, you know. So I, I used to, the way you hold a pen is important. You know, I used to hold a pen really badly before I went to see Anne Cam. See that finger, it's bent. Yeah, I, I have just something small here yeah. building up. <laughs> yeah, because the pen just rests there. Okay, let me see. And you hold it at the knuckle. Yeah. Like this? Or what? Yeah, a bit, move the nib, uh, the holder a bit to your right, to the knuckle. No, the other way, sorry. Yeah, that's it. That's fine there. Yeah. And also, you don't hold the nib too far away from your finger. Okay. Because that way, there isn't that connect between you, the nib and the paper. Yeah. But it, it feels strange because I usually, I don't know, I guess my, my fingers go like almost like this yeah and i'm used to write like this so but now it's funny because a friend of mine he brought like speedball nips and i usually yeah. i usually use brows so i didn't have and when i put the speedball it created it's exactly exactly this what is happening now like way too space yeah. from the paper and i'm not used to yeah. this i mean you know again i i won't tell anyone to use anything in particular but Having done research into it and looked into lettering, most of the lettering that's been in manuscripts that we look at and admire were done with an obliquely cut nib. Mm. Speedball is straight, it's flat. Yeah. Browser has got an oblique cut to it. Yes. So the shape of the letters is more in keeping with what you're looking at. Otherwise, you spend time going, why isn't it doing that? That's why you retouch because of broad edge. A flat nib won't do what a brat of what a bleak cut nib does. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean that's why I said that piece of that paper, that sheet, and that book is so important. Hmm. Send me your email, or I'll take a picture of it and send it to you so you can see. Mm -hmm. 
because you know such knowledge is to be shared yes if i just put that on instagram people are going what the hell is he doing with that page you know you need knowledge to be able to get the knowledge from it well if you put that page there is also captions so you can do some explanation what or why yeah. is this page there you know of course not everybody's gonna read the captions but of course I'm... not they just go tick like no tick like no <laughs> yeah you know attention spam of people becomes really bad yeah like... it's like a goldfish three seconds uh i don't know <laughs> i mean it's it's uh, it's, me, it's not funny i i i think it's a huge issue it's not good but uh... when you teach you know a lot of the times they go yeah but i can't do it it's not you can't do it you won't do it yes you know the word can't doesn't exist if you want to do something you can work on it you know all right you might not be able to understand it the first the second the third the fourth time eventually you will no hmm. what you put into it is what you get out of it hmm. but yeah um, like i said i'm happy to teach anyone want you know even if somebody wants a piece of advice they can just get hold of me and i'm happy to oh we'll definitely do something with calligraphy masters i mean i, I myself want to attend this like it, it like whatever we spoke today it seems yeah. super interesting and not only interesting but very important and I think yeah. it, it will be very useful to not only me, but, but to a lot of people. It should be, because all, all what's happening now is imitation without understanding. Yeah. What, what you can then do is understand with knowledge. And, you know, I, I don't really like to, when I'm teaching, I don't really like to write, far, write in front of the class or something, because they think that, they write as fast as I do, they'll get a fluency. Uh, you know, it, fluency is not got through speed. Fluency got through understanding. That's something I never thought about. You know, when I teach, my best workshops, my best class are held in the bar after the class. <laughs> because in the class, you've got an agenda, you know, you've got a curriculum that you've set out, you know, and some students will say, but you didn't do that, you didn't do that. Well, it depends on the speed of the class, how much they're taking in, how much they're absorbing. People don't always work at the same rate. You know, some work at different, some are faster, some are slower. But in a in a social environment after the class, knowledge will be sucked out of you depending on where the students are and who they are. They just want and that information comes out because in a class you can only go so far because you've got to keep them on that track. But after the class, you could just go on and say, right, okay, this is doing, that's happening. And you could bring tangents together and make it gel in one piece. All right. I guess some, I was told you did the Marvel thing. You've done also some stuff for BBC. What is this? Can you speak about it? Yeah, I've done quite a few jobs for the BBC. I've done title sequences for two or three TV programs. One was QED. Okay. Uh, it's a scientific investigative program mm -hmm. and their initial logo was a neon QED and they said that they wanted something more organic and something a little bit more practical so what I thought we'd do was looking for people this here I'll put paper oh there's the classic Roman QED like that oh mm -hmm. sorry I knew it, it worked out fine. It was done in like Trajan capitals. And I'm thinking, how can it make this organic? How can we do this? I walked away from my desk and if that slipped and fell down, upside down. So when I looked at it, that looks like an apple. It sorted and said, look, you know, that's Newton's theory gravity was because an apple hit him on the head <laughs> <laughs> yeah he fell out so the title sequence actually starts with an apple falling down turning upside down becoming the cue for GED <laughs> uh, so cool. uh, I've also done a few series I uh, worked on a series called a Woman in White I was actually a hand double in there for an actor okay uh, he's an Asian actor. Uh, on this finger of his, he's got a scar on his nail. They're to 
do a scar on my nail as well. <laughs> it didn't look like somebody else. And there's another series I worked on called Saints and Sinners, Millennium of uh, Britain's Monasteries. And I had to produce a, pe a page from the Lindisfarne Gospels hmm. in the same style, in the same conditions that describe and written the manuscript in. And right. in, at that time, they didn't have a building that was a scriptorium for them. And what they used to do was, on a board, they used to follow the sun. So they took all their paints and stuff, sat down, and when the sun comes, it, you know, say the sun's there, an hour later it's gone there. So they'd move there. I had to write, I had to do a page in the same circumstances that the monk was doing it in. And it was horrific because, you know, the vellum, the calfskin, is organic, yeah? yeah. And it absorbs moisture, so it cockles. Yeah. <laughs> Your hands get cold, you get cold. If you're sitting there for an hour, not moving, you become cold. I was actually in William Shakespeare on the South Bank Show, which is an arts programme. This was done years ago. And they called me on a, I can't remember what day it was anyway. And they said, can you write like Shakespeare? Because well, <laughs> no one knows how he wrote like, but we've got, a, there's only one validated signature of his, but I can write in the period of the writing that was at the time. Yep. Can you write with the quill? Yep. Okay. We're filming on Thursday. Turn up at this address, nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I turn up. They didn't blink an eyelid. Shakespeare's been on holiday, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. do you get even excited when you work for something like Marvel or you get your work futured in British Life? I don't know. It seems to me like for you, it's, it's just something very normal. I get excited by every job that I do. Project or job that you had was the most exciting for you, like that it really fired you up. My two daughters. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. But I mean, in, in the calligraphy... Sense. I don't know, it's difficult to say. It really is. I mean, each one brings us some challenges with it. Okay, like for uh, example, what were the challenges in Doctor Strange? Writing in a language I don't can't speak or write. <laughs> but like, okay, this, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, how do you get hired to do something that you you never done? Like, is it all based on uh, what it's called? It's based on the ability to be able to do it. It's like, you know, if you, a friend of mine's a photographer's agent, and mm. so she has to send out portfolios of photographers. Uh, if an art director wants, a, wants somebody to photograph a banana, what they will do is they will look at photographs of bananas that somebody's taken, rather than what somebody could do with a banana to make it different. Make yeah. it stand out. You know, and this is what people with vision can do. Yes. They can mm. see through what's written on the page. I see. Yeah, mm. because, you know, oh, I've designed typefaces. And one of them is based on Sanskrit. This is so cool. Yeah, and I've done that. That's like a brushy one. And then this, which is more black letter based. Is this all handmade? Yeah, they're all hand drawn and then digitized into a typeface. Nice. I mean, this one was really awkward, difficult to do the bottom one because it was based on a type on some lettering that somebody had found on playing cards, and they wanted to keep the same kind of idiosyncrasies of the typeface. They wanted it to look like that. And the thing is with the typeface is that once you've done it, you lose a, a Put it out in the public domain. You lose ownership of it. It's not yours anymore. People will do what they want, how they want. Screw it up completely. You know, like with this one. Similar. That's named after my younger daughter. In the Devanagari script, there isn't an upper and lower case. It's all the same case. But for a Roman alphabet, we need an upper and lower case. And I said that the upper case has got the bar running across it. The lowercase doesn't. So hmm. use that as a headliner and that as body text. Yeah. But what people are doing is they're using 
up a lowercase together and it doesn't work. Ah, oh, do you remember in, when was it? If you follow football at all, you know, Liverpool beat Roma in Istanbul. Okay. In the final of the European Championship, European Cup. Mm -hmm. the, to advertise it, the word Istanbul was written in, was written, done using Simran. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I was on the train coming, tube coming home. And my friend's on the phone to me. Sammy, 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 have you seen me? I said, I'm on the bloody train. I'm not watching telly at the moment. <laughs> but they're using Simran. <laughs> <laughs> so how many phones have you created or how many you have that are... Uh, these developed? are the ones that I created from beginning. Okay. And there's others that we've done. It's like for camel cigarettes. They give you the word camel and want you to make a whole typeface out of it. A typeface design is really weird because once you've drawn the letters, you've got to, obviously, you've got to digitize them, clean them up, make, but then you've got to kern and space them, which is so boring. <laughs> oh, God. You've got to take an A and a B, an A and a C, an A and a D, an A and a, a, space them. Then you've got to take a B and a C, a B and a D. Wow. To everything. Uh, do you know how many characters are needed to make a typeface? No. You say 26 letters, 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, 10 numerals, commas, dots, this, that, and the other. Yeah. 60, 100 at the moment. <laughs> 216. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Why yeah. is it so many? Accents, it's because typefaces are used worldwide now. You know, you've got to get umlauts onto it, all those accents. So how much time does it take from beginning to, like, from the very start, take, starting on paper to get a finished typeface? It can be very quick. It depends on who you're designing it for and what they want. If it's for a corporate, you know, it can take forever. Yeah. This one, you know, this is what? The typeface is based on independence. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the lettering in there is all over the place, right? Yeah. Because it was done by hand by somebody, and you have to make it into a typeface. Hmm. Now, this is what I was talking about. It's understand how the lettering is put together. Right? Yeah. That, can you see that? A sad yeah. CBD having. And that's done by hand. Wow. Right, that's because I understood how that's done. I can make that. No, I, I think we definitely have to make such <laughs> works the worst such workshop. Yeah. And then these are the letters. Because you have to do them separately. Yeah, but they're 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 drawn, they're not written, right? Yeah, they're written. But come on, like those details, like the circle stuff, and I don't think you write this. No, you... no, no, no. I won't write like that. But I'm reproducing something that's already been done. Yeah. And the only way of doing that is to go over it and retouch it, and make it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Like even that Y at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that also the other thing is that because I'm writing larger than what the original was which is that size yeah when you, when you come to the bottom you, you put a little bit of pressure onto the nib it'll mm. block it'll make it bigger yeah yeah and it will do that mm. but when you're writing that big you can't do it you can't put that much pressure on it so you've got to touch it out mm. that's because i wanted i wanted it to be exactly like that that's the lower case of, that we did. Then you scan it, digitize it, and turn it because you know you've got to do so many. You've got to do ligatures as well. Wow! And that's why I said you know a type designer, typographer, type designer should always study calligraphy because we understand how type works, how the ligatures work, and it's all natural movement. Theirs look too static. I mean, if you look at the V. Normally, I wouldn't put it in a typeface because it's not in keeping with the rest of it. When you look at the, the lettering in here, there's a sample of a V in there. That's that. So you've got to do that to it. Wow. I mean, 
like <laughs> the M is wonky. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what it's in there. This typeface, but this one is much more consistent to creating a unified typeface. Yeah. I really like the the one below the pink one. It's yeah. Fun. This is so cool. Looks yeah. Good. I mean, I, it is the same actually, isn't it? It's like, that... like the one, yeah, yeah. Because you know, again, typefaces look different at different sizes. Yeah, true. There's certain typefaces that you can't use that big, and there's certain that you can't use that small. That's why they do typefaces in three different weights. And I mean, if you look at that S there, the spacing, it's not quite right for an R and an S. And wherever you put it, because of how it appears there, yeah. you see there's a bigger gap there. Yeah. Then with the other letters, so I've got to reflect that in the final design. That is so much learning to do, so much teaching to do. We'll do it. <laughs> well... For you, it's teaching. For us, it's learning. <laughs> yeah, but again, I learn from my students. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of people that I've talked with, they all say like, when you start, once you start teaching, you actually mm. learn a lot. Yeah, because in, what it all does is... In this because... case, have you learned more from your teachers or from your students? At the moment, I say from my teachers, honestly. <laughs> Because yeah. without them, I wouldn't be able to pass that information. Of course, you learn from your students, but the information they parted to me is second mm -hmm. to, you know, you just can't touch it or meet it or anything. What is the best advice that you received about calligraphy that helped you the most? Get your intention right and the execution will be good. It's like once you know, it's like they say, clear thinking leads to clean answers. Modeled thinking leads to modeled answers. Mm -hmm. so you've got to get your thinking clear. Intention, it, it'll change over a period of time because mm -hmm. you can start doing one thing and it, it leads you to a different direction. But don't be afraid to stray off the route that you think you're going to go under because that, what you got the route that's taking you could, could, might be a better solution. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, is take risks. Yeah. Without risks, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to become static. Definitely. Uh, you're not so much social media person, but uh, can you name some people that are not so known or maybe they're beginners, but you have so potential in their calligraphy? Yeah, there's one that I've seen. Yeah. And I think you know who that is. Who is that? <laughs> Arvind. Which one? Arvind. Arvind? Yeah. Is he gave this... you my details yesterday. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, is this the, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll check his work. And yeah. uh, I mean, we are already like almost two hours, so I guess we okay. Yeah, like time flies. Like uh, I really enjoyed this podcast, but uh, I was anytime thinking... you want to have a chat, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll do this another time as well. But I was thinking, uh, who would you recommend me to get on the podcast that might be useful and helpful for people from our generation? Somebody of your rank, let's say something like this. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone's above my rank, trust me. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> come uh, on. You know what I ask. Yeah, can I just think about it and give you an answer? Sh sure, you can send me one on Instagram yeah. and I will just add it to the video. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Of course, yeah, I'll think about it um, because I don't want to, because then my name is on the line so. <laughs> fair enough fair enough okay in yeah. that case uh if you want to wish something give advice or something like this to the people that are listening or people which are just considering to start calligraphy what would you tell them devote yourself to it immerse yourself in it and be critical of what you do because i i won't be there or nobody will be there to tell you to look at it and see what the mistakes or differences that you're doing 
you've got to be your best critic. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to criticize yourself because without criticism, you are not going to learn. Awesome. Look at, look at what you're looking at and look at what you're doing. See the difference between the two and then go for what you would like to do. I think this is perfect ending. Uh, Sami, it, it, it's been a huge honor and huge pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for being guest on the pleasure. podcast. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yes, likewise. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, leave a like, leave a comment uh, on the video. Subscribe wherever you're absorbing this podcast. And as always, keep writing. Do that. Keep flourishing. Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs>